San Diego is the jewel of Southern California. People from all over the world come here to enjoy the surf, the sun, the culture of Southern California. They come here to do business, they come here to live, and they come here to retire in a virtual paradise. Hi, I'm Dr. Pat Abbott. I'm a geology professor at San Diego State University. This allows me the great good fortune to live and work right here in San Diego. When we begin to think about why people are so attracted to this place, we have to ask ourselves, what makes it so desirable? Well, we have a world-class zoo, we have a deep water bay that welcomes ships of the world, and we have a cultural and ethnic blend that puts energy, business, and life into the community. But thousands of years ago, long before San Diego ever had a name, people still came to this place. They came because it offered an abundance of food, both from the sea and from the land. It had a moderate climate, it was a good place to live, and with any luck, a place to grow old in relative comfort. But at the core of San Diego's success lies the actual shape of the land. And as geologists, we have peeled back the layers to discover the forces that shaped a land with so many attributes. It's exciting to look around a rich geological terrain like San Diego and know how it came to be. How did Mount Soledad form? Where did Mission Bay come from? Or Point Loma? Or the Silver Strand? Well, we're going back in time and speed up the geological time frame and watch what happens. Before there was a Mission Beach, before the cliffs at Torrey Pines, before Mount Soledad, before there was even a bay, we're going back to when San Diego was just a beach. The landscape of San Diego has been shaped by large-scale processes. Rise and fall of sea level, regional tilting of the land, the shifting and warping caused by movements on faults in the Rose Canyon system. But changes in the landscape are barely perceptible when viewed during any given year. But if we apply a geologic measurement of, say, a million years, then the changes become readily apparent. And this is the backbone of geology that small changes, day by day, year by year, when viewed over millions of years, add up to major geologic effects. We can understand the shape of the land in San Diego during the last million years if we divide it into three acts. The first act opens with high sea levels retreating westward from a rising land mass. In act two, the Rose Canyon Fault alters the land. It changes the outline of the coastline it raises hills, it lowers land, which fills with water to create bays. And in Act 3, from 14,000 to 9,000 years ago, as glaciers in the northern hemisphere rapidly retreated, the sea level rose, setting the stage to form some of San Diego's most remarkable terrain. I'm on the top of Mount Soledad. To the west lies La Jolla and the Pacific Ocean. On the south, is Mission Bay and Point Loma. And at the base of the mountain, there is Interstate 5, where it connects with Highway 52. But when I sweep my eyes from northeast to southeast, I see a broad plain cut through by valleys running from east to west. That's the Linda Vista Mesa. In the middle of the mesa is the Miramar Marine Air Station surrounded by thousands of homes, businesses, roads, everything that a human being might need to survive in today's world. But a million years ago, it was all underwater. If you know what to look for, you can actually see what we geologists call the one million year old sea cliffs. They're right here. And if you want to know what they look like in their prime, go just off today's shoreline 
and look back at the sea cliffs at Torrey Pines State Beach. Towering cliffs up to 300 feet tall with the surf pounding at their base. But behind the scenes, enormous forces were at work because the million year sea cliffs are more than nine miles from the ocean today. How did that happen? How did the sea cliffs and the ocean get that far apart? Well, several things began to happen at the same time. And remember, we're talking in geologic time. The seafloor began to rise, to uplift. And as the land began to rise in the east, the sea, simultaneously, began to retreat in a westward direction. As each bit of seafloor in its turn became beach, the ocean began to scrub and abrade the seafloor, creating a hard platform covered with sand and gravel several feet thick. This was later cemented together by salts crystallized from groundwater. The result is that today we have nearly flat ground that makes an excellent natural foundation for building homes, schools, and businesses. The uplifted and drained sea floors are dominant features in San Diego, but what happens when land is raised and exposed to the atmosphere? It meets the great equalizer, erosion. Bad for the land, good for us, because it creates the valleys that provide habitats for plants and animals and opportunities for us. We're here in the Soil Erosion Research Laboratory. It's located in the Department of Civil Engineering here at San Diego State University. And the reason this apparatus was built is to learn ways to prevent erosion along California's roadways. And this is done by eroding different mixtures of earth materials to see how they erode on a much smaller scale. Here's how it works. Sediment mixtures are packed down, forming horizontal surfaces in this 12-foot by 30-foot bed. The entire apparatus is tilted, and artificial rain is applied with resultant erosion. In a small scale, and in a short time, it gives clues to how a real area will erode. Just as these experiments simulate the erosion on a larger scale and longer time interval of given soil mixtures, it also demonstrates how the uplifted Linda Vista Mesa, the ancient seafloor, has been eroded by rainfall and has run off and carved the topography that we know today. We don't see it very readily because the sheer scale of the erosion is so great it has actually turned gullies into valleys. As we drive uphill and down slope traveling about town, it is easy to get overwhelmed by the scale of the landscape. We lose perspective of the relatively simple origin of the mesa and valley topography. But the uplift and erosion are not the only forces at work here. As we near the modern coastline, we notice something else has happened. The landscape has been shifted, warped, and dropped. For instance, if you look at San Clemente Canyon, that's the canyon that houses Highway 52, you'll notice that as it runs west toward the ocean, it abruptly makes a 90 degree turn to the south-southeast. It then travels down Rose Canyon into Mission Bay. The land has been so distorted by active faulting that the very rivers that cut these canyons were forced to change their courses. They created new canyons across the regional slope of the land. They had to change direction because they met up with the Rose Canyon Fault. Now, in southernmost California, we have many active faults. The San Andreas, San Jacinto, Elsinore, Rose Canyon, Coronado Islands, the San Clemente Island Fault. And each of these faults has one thing in common. Their western side moves to the northwest faster than its eastern side. It's like two great ships on a collision course. They're both moving, but Western California and Baja California move faster and scrape by North America. They are traveling northwest on the Pacific Plate. All of these moving faults have major effects on Southern California land. 
but the one that most affects the topography of San Diego is the Rose Canyon Fault System. It begins along the east side of San Diego Bay and travels north through La Jolla, then runs offshore for 65 miles until the curving coastline causes it to come back on shore where it is then known as the Newport Inglewood Fault. And that end of the fault, the northern end, in 1933 caused a 6.3 magnitude earthquake that still reigns today as the second deadliest earthquake in California history. We know it as the Long Beach earthquake. It killed 120 people and caused damages exceeding 600 million in today's dollars. On the plus side, it was also the earthquake that was responsible for changing construction standards for schools and brick buildings in the state of California. Fortunately for us, our end of the fault has not generated a large earthquake, at least not in historic time. But in geologic time, the Rose Canyon Fault has been responsible for shaping much of the San Diego terrain. And it has done this in several ways. One way is called offset. Here we have layered construction materials representing the earth. When I begin to turn the crank on this vise, the west side pushes out to the north. If this west side is viewed as a coastline, then the land, the shoreline, moves out into the ocean. Visualize the faults tearing miles deep into the earth. Does it tear on a single fault? Does it tear only on a single line? Let's follow the trend of the Rose Canyon faults on this photo. Straight along San Diego Bay, straight through Old Town, straight along Mission Bay, straight up Rose Canyon. But just before reaching Highway 52 and Ardith Road, the faults bend sharply to the left. What effect does this left bend have on the land? These sheets of paper represent rock layers. If we push them to the north, like the Rose Canyon Fault moves, the paper deforms upward, like the rock layers do, to form Mount Soledad. If we keep pushing them, the rock layers deform downward, like Mission Bay, down below sea level. The hills and bays that help make coastal San Diego such a special place are due to the effects of the active Rose Canyon Fault system. Compression on the west side of the Rose Canyon Fault at the bend south of Ardith Road has warped up Mount Soledad, down warped Mission Bay, and up warped Point Loma. Pull apart in the zone between the ends of the Rose Canyon and Descanso Faults has down dropped San Diego Bay, which severed from the land to the east along the La Nacion Fault System. Cross faults in the transfer zone lifted up the land to make both North and Coronado Islands. So we look backwards and study what has happened. And as we begin to see a clearer picture of the processes that created Mount Soledad, or San Diego Bay, or Coronado, then we can also begin to appreciate the numbers and sizes of earthquakes that accompanied these deformations of the Earth. Hey, I'm up here on top of the San Diego National Bank building. From here, we can see San Diego Bay with its marine traffic. And it really is a superb bay for its commerce, its recreation, and of course, its beauty. But 120,000 years ago, had this building been here, it would have looked like this. So why would this building be underwater? For more than two and a half million years, the Earth has been locked in an ice age. In fact, sheets of ice up to two miles thick once covered 25% of North America. It was very much like Antarctica and Greenland are today. So where did the ice come from and where did it go? Well, the Earth constantly changes. In geological time, continents drift. And when the continents drift, 
they may divert warm equatorial ocean water to the polar latitudes. Warm seawater evaporates into the atmosphere. That moisture is carried aloft and crystallizes as snow in northern latitudes. It begins an ice building cycle. When Earth's orbit and tilt cause less solar energy to reach us, much of the winter snow does not melt during the summer. It simply becomes deeper and heavier. So the lower layers are compressed into solid ice. And because ice is weak, it deforms and then flows farther across continents. It is not returned to the ocean. Simply stated, the evaporated seawater is stored on land as ice, which means the sea level drops. And as Earth's orbit and tilt continue to change, a warming cycle returns. Just the opposite occurs. The ice melts and the sea level rises. And this cycle of rise and fall, rise and fall, happens many times throughout geologic history. In fact, just 11,000 years ago, the global sea level was 400 feet lower. What did San Diego look like then? There was no San Diego Bay, no Mission Bay, no Silver Strand. They have all formed in the last 9,000 years. The latest retreat of the continental ice sheets occurred rapidly in less than 5,000 years. As sea level rose, the San Diego shoreline looked different. One huge bay with three islands. Today, Mission Beach is a unique and lively beach community enjoyed by residents and tourists alike. But 9,000 years ago, it simply was not here. Now, Mission Beach was not created by uplift, and the tremendous forces of the Rose Canyon Fault, just two and a half miles to the west, did not create Mission Beach. Mission Beach was created one wave at a time, day by day, year by year, century by century. Waves arriving from the North Pacific Ocean hit most West Coast beaches at an angle. Because they hit at an angle, and because most of the waves came from the Northwest, they pushed tons of sand southward along the coast. As the sand collected, it built southward into what we now call Mission Beach. But other natural forces began to factor into the equation, and all three of these islands would be greatly affected. These surfers come out here for one reason, to ride the waves. Hardcore surfers study and know how global weather patterns affect their particular part of surfing paradise. In this instance, the forces they are riding have created a significant part of San Diego today. Over the millennia, as each flood season came and went, the ancient Tijuana River dumped millions of tons of sand and mud into its delta, which was built out into the ocean. During the late summer, hurricanes in the southern hemisphere, some as far away as New Zealand, generated enormous waves. And as they came, they picked up the sand from the river's mouth and began to redistribute it. They began to build a barrier. And as the barrier became larger and longer, over six miles in length, it connected with two islands, Coronado and North. And they became tied to the mainland. Today, we call this six-mile barrier the Silver Strand. And though we refer to Coronado Island and North Island, they are now really part of a peninsula. So while surfers enjoy the late summer waves on the ocean side of the beach, we realize because of Silver Strand in the south and Mission Beach in the north, the coastline is no longer open to the ocean. It is now, for the first time, a bay. But how did this mega bay get divided into two, with San Diego Bay to the south and Mission Bay to the north? And what about the third and largest island? Well, it was positioned just off the coast, opposite the mouth of the ancient San Diego River. Like the ancient Tijuana River, as each flood season came and went, 
the San Diego River dumped enormous amounts of sand and mud into its ever-expanding delta. And as the delta grew, it reached farther out into the bay. A few thousand years ago, it met the island and connected it to the mainland. And it split the mega bay into two smaller bays. To the north is Mission Bay, and in the south is San Diego Bay. Today, the island is called Point Loma, and the land that grew outward is the San Diego River Delta, is called the Midway District, which is where I am right now. Now, the ground may appear firm enough, but in actuality, it is made of loose sand. The river has simply dumped it into the bay. By geological description, it is a weak, water-saturated material, but it has become the foundation for some of San Diego's most widely used structures. In fact, all of the sewer pipes from San Diego cross this unstable sediment on their way to the sewage treatment plant on Point Loma. When we have a major earthquake on the Rose Canyon Fault, this property, the Midway District, will liquefy. Our human-built structures will fail. No operating Lindbergh Field. No sewage treatment. Of course, badly damaged roads and all of the other problems that accompany a major fault movement. But another reality is, even when we have a major earthquake, the worst we can imagine, it will still be a simple chiropractic adjustment in geologic terms. And the process never stops. The earth is always shedding its skin. So let's speed up the last million years and see what happened. Regional uplift caused the retreating sea to cut Linda Vista and Otay Mesas as glacial advances and retreats lowered and raised the sea level many times. Movements within the Rose Canyon Fault warped and shifted the land, creating Mount Soledad, Mission Bay, and the three islands of Coronado, North, and Loma. Ocean waves from the north pushed sand south to form Mission Beach. Just as summer waves from the south washed Tijuana River Delta sand to the north to form the silver strand that captured Coronado and North Islands. Meanwhile, the San Diego River Delta built outward and attached the Big Island to the mainland to create Point Loma. So here we are in the now. And knowing what we know about the past makes it fun to think about what the next million years might bring. So let's take an educated guess. If present trends continue, Linda Vista and Otay Mesas will continue to rise. The Rose Canyon Fault will squeeze Mount Soledad even higher and drop Mission Bay even lower. And remember, the continental ice sheets both grow and shrink. When they shrink and retreat, melting ice on Greenland and Antarctica will cause the sea level to rise 200 feet forming beachfront property in Mission Valley and San Isidro. Conversely, when glaciers grow and advance, the sea level will drop 400 feet lower than now, several times, emptying San Diego and Mission Bays, leaving the present coastal communities high and dry and making the Coronado Islands part of the mainland. It is certainly interesting to speculate, but the truth is, Every time we think we have this old world figured out, she manages to surprise us. And anyway, that's a million years from now. We might as well go surfing.